Would you please stand again and sing with us? Thank you. 
14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, I am the Lord. We know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 1 through 6. <laughs> So if you cannot understand the things of God, how can you grow and be transformed into the likeness of Christ? That is a problem, right? So, so what God has done is he's given me the opportunity to go back to Uganda. I retired from, from my ministry at a church in, in uh, northeastern Indiana uh, after being there for 32 years. And now my focus is uh, primarily Uganda for right now. So I go to Uganda three times a year for a week at a time. I have two different schools that I teach. I have 23 men that I teach. And the goal is each of those men will teach at least two other people while they're being taught. 
So in theory, right now, we are training over 60 people with the 23 guys that I'm working with. Um, now time will tell how good of a job that is and, and we're doing and how effective that is. But for now, I'm super excited about these men. They are brilliant. They are men with amazing minds. They have a heart for God. Most of them are already pastoring churches. Some of them are elders or other leaders in their churches. Others are newer believers. What we've discovered is some of the people that are pastors have been so tainted by bad theology that they are not willing to be taught. So we have some men that are newer to the faith, but we get to grow them from the ground up, and we're super excited about that. And so as we come together, we are teaching them the Word of God. Now, I'm sure your pastor has taught you this, and so you're probably going to say, we've heard this before, but I want to talk to you a little bit about how to understand the Scriptures and why that is so important. And then at the end of all this, hopefully, you'll say this, this makes a little bit of sense. So... When, when we think about studying the scriptures, there are three words that go into good, sound understanding of the Bible as we study it. The first one is literal, the second is historical, and the third is grammatical. You say, wait a minute, I did not sign up today to come to a seminary class. Well, hopefully that's not going to be what you're going to get. But you do need to understand how to study the Word of God. When we say literal, we do not mean that when Jesus says, I am the door, he means that he's a piece of wood, right? We're talking about the normal way that language is used in life. And in normal language, we use figures of speech, right? And so if I say to you, now where I come from, I'm sorry, but I'm from Nebraska. And that, that's a long way away. And you think, Nebraska, that's a bunch of hicks over there. Guilty as charged, okay? But when I say I'm bush, I do not mean I'm green leafy twigs that have little, little things that flop around in the wind. What do I mean? I'm tired, right? That's a figure of speech that we use as a normal part of language, right? Normal, literal language is language, how people use it in their dialect, in their world, to convey the meaning. When we talk about studying the scriptures literally, we're saying, how did the Hebrew speakers of the Old Testament and the Greek speakers of the New Testament use their language when they used it? Oh. What that means is, I have to enter into their world. I have to understand what they meant when they said it, not what I think it means in my day. That's a danger of modern Bible study. Because people today will say, let's get together, and let's read a passage, and let's all talk about what it means to us. And you're in trouble already. Because what it means to you may not at all be what it meant to them. Because in this process, we understand that people did not write the Bible. People were the means by which God wrote the Bible. So when you read the Bible, you're not reading the Word of Man, you're reading the Word of God. And God used those people to communicate His Word exactly the way He wanted it communicated. So when we study the original languages of Hebrew and Greek, we're hearing God speak to us through these words, just the way He wanted to say it. And that includes figures of speech, because he used them, their thinking, their world, their culture, all these things to communicate truths through the medium of those words. And so, as we study, we're saying, what did it mean to them in their world? And how do we now understand it out of that? That is literal. Now with that, there's a second word, historical. I'm going to use that last because I want to talk about some history with you this morning. You say, oh no, we've gone from theology class to history class. This is really horrible. Hold on. Let's talk about grammatical. What that means is the words that God used were given exactly the way he wanted them in, in their grammatical structure of Hebrew and Greek. And we can study that because God has gifted people to understand and study those ancient languages and pass on how we can use those and know exactly what they were talking about. And so, there are some crazy people in this world that actually like to study ancient languages. Praise God for those crazy people. Because we get to learn from them, and we have a certainty about understanding God's Word that is amazing from that. And so we can come, and when we look at the text, we're actually seeing the forms of grammar. So we're talking about what verb tense they, did they use. Was it past tense, present tense, or future? Is it singular or plural? Is it talking about an individual or a group? 
And, and how do we understand these words? And they have these unique forms in the languages that give us really specific details about how we should understand the words. And so we're studying not only how they understood it, but we're understanding how they understood it with their grammar and their vocabulary. And that's super important because when I say the word baptism to you, what comes to your mind first of all? Just tell me. Immersion. Immersion. Water baptism, right? Did you know that that's one of the uses of that in the scriptures, but it's not the only use. There is spirit baptism. There is water baptism. There's a baptism of fire. There's a baptism of John. I say, wait a minute. What about, what are all these things? Oh, you need to understand those not only in their proper reference of the people and their language, but you need to understand their context. Because context determines the meaning of every word. Have you ever done that? Where you walk into a room and somebody's talking and you hear them talking and you think you know what they're talking about, but you don't know what they're talking about at all. Have you ever done that? And then if you jump into that conversation, they think you're just crazy because you don't even know what you're talking about because you didn't know what they were talking about. That happens with the Bible. People don't know what they're talking about because they think they know what the Bible's talking about and they don't. That's because they don't know the context. So now, as I teach our students, I have two schools, one in the very western part of Uganda, one in the very eastern part. I have these 23 students, uh, and these guys are amazing, and, and they're just this incredible gift from God that they have this heart to learn, and they are so able to grasp things. But they have been taught false things for many years. So we are seeking to retrain their thinking, but the retraining is not just trying to make them Americans. That's the last thing I want to do. I do not want to reproduce America in their life. They are Ugandans. They are people with that culture and that heritage. And so what I teach them is the Bible is supra-cultural. It is above culture. And when we come together around the Word of God, it draws us together. I love seeing a blended congregation here. Because we have different, different amounts of melanin in our skin, but we're the same family, right? We have the same mom and dad, Adam and Eve. And just because we got divided at the Tower of Babel, we look a little bit different. But you cut me, I'm going to be, bleed the same color as you. And so I love being one family with God's people all over the world. And I love seeing it here. And, I, and may God bless you and may that grow. And may this be an amazingly strong body of people who are convinced that the Bible is above culture. The issue is not skin, it's sin, right? And I can prove that to you, because in Uganda, everybody has lots of melanin in their skin. They're dark-skinned people, but you know what? They fight, and they hate each other, and they kill each other because they're from the wrong tribe. Or because they're a different economic level, or because you have something I want. I want to take it away from you, right? That's the problem. It's the heart. Same problem we have. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about this, we need context. And, and context is everything. My dear friends, one of the most confusing books of the Bible to me has been the book of 1 Corinthians. I will tell you that as a young Christian and as a growing Christian, it drove me crazy. Because there's so many things in there that are confusing. And so many things that we hear taught that just don't make sense. And we try to take them and use them in our world and, and it creates all kinds of struggles. I've got good news for you. History is an amazing gift when we talk about the book of 1 Corinthians. And so, as I teach my students, I teach them how to study the Bible. And part of this is, we study the, the literal use of the words, we study the grammar, we study the history. Today, I want to talk with you just briefly about the history of the city of Corinth. Now, Mike, have you done that? Oh, man. I'm going to be preaching to the choir. Well, maybe I'll give you a few things that Mike hasn't found, and, and I hope that, that uh, he doesn't end up branding me a heretic. <laughs> but let's see how we do. So Corinth as a city was, was an, an established Greek city. Because of its rebellion, it was destroyed by the Romans. They came back and rebuilt it around 44, 46, and it was a city that was built in honor of Julius Caesar. This is, by the way, 44, 46 B.C., all right? By the time of the New Testament church, 
It was a thriving, large, prosperous city. It was wealthy because it was built between two seas, and they had this overland route that people had to take, and they got charged for it. And so they made lots of money, and of course you know what happens when there's lots of money in the seaport. All kinds of businesses come, and with that you get everything from all over the world. And Corinth was a place that was filled with idolatry. There were many different gods that were worshipped. Poseidon was worshipped there. But, but some of the, the key gods and goddesses that were worshipped there, the Roman names and the Greek names were blended together. And so Venus was the Roman name. Aphrodite was the Greek name. The goddess of love. No, not really. She was a goddess of lust. She was a goddess of unbridled lust. She was all about free sex, about doing whatever you wanted. She was a goddess of treachery. The people who followed her were proud of their immorality. And she had a temple. They had a temple dedicated to her up on the hill that had a thousand prostitutes that were called priestesses. And the way this religion worked was the men who, who were supposedly involved in this went to the priestesses, and the way they got rid of their sins was through sex. You know what, my friends, I will tell you, virtually every false religion in the world, and especially idolatry, always finds a way to connect its worship to sexuality. Almost consistently all through the world. And so this was a huge thing in Corinth. And, and when we think about her son, Venus, Aphrodite, had a son. He was named Dionysius in the Greek world and Bacchus in the Roman world. Have you heard of that before? The, the Bacchan cult was also a cult of, of excitement and ecstasy. Bacchus was the god of wine. He was a god of wine. Bacchus and, and, and Aphrodite both were worshipped heavily by women. So why was that such a big deal? Well, let's talk more about history. The history of Corinth and, and of that time in the Greek and the Roman world had some very interesting things that they thought about women and the way women and men's relationships should be conducted. And so in their world, when a woman was married, she basically got locked in at home. Her husband did not really talk to her. She did not have educational opportunities. She did not have spiritually enriching opportunities. They didn't talk hardly at all. Her only purpose was to have a legal heir for the husband. So a man could have, have uh, offspring, but he only had a legal son if he adopted the person. Say, so wait a minute, your own kids? It was a legal process whereby you went to the magistrates and you said, I'm making this person my legal heir. This is so important when we talk about being adopted as God's children, my friends. Because what it says is, God chose to make you his legal heirs at the moment you placed your faith in Christ. He said, you're mine, you're going to get my inheritance. Oh, that is so important, isn't it? That's, that's history, my friends. That's history and how it dovetails with the Bible. And you need to know that because it encourages you in your faith, right? Good stuff. So, so this woman, unfortunately, is locked in at home. And, and actually, men had this, this disdain for their wives many times. They, they feared women. They, they had this, this disdain for women, especially as they aged. Some of their poets... And it's just gross stuff. I'm sorry, but this is Corinth, okay? Some of their poets praised homosexuality as one of the highest virtues. As a matter of fact, the male poets, some of them said that it was a, a, a crime, a, a shame, that God made it necessary for men to have sex with women, to have children, because sex with men and boys in particular was so much more preferable. This is a gross world, right? Say, man, this sounds like our world. We're coming to that. We're coming to that. In this world, the men left their wives at home. They went out and they had relationships, both intellectual and physical, with these, these courtesans, these women who were professional prostitutes, some of them from the Temple of Aphrodite. They were intelligent, they were educated, they owned their own homes, their own property, and they made a lot of money from what they did. And so the men had their wives for legal offspring, and they had these, these, these mistresses for fun and for, and for, for inter interaction. Now listen, when we start thinking about this, there's so much of this we don't have time to talk about, 
But this is in, so heavily involved in the book of 1 Corinthians because in 1 Corinthians 14 it says that the women are not to speak out in church, but they're to talk to their husbands at home. Do you realize that was a massive upgrade for them? Because first of all, it said the women are actually allowed at church, number one. Number two, they're actually going to have interaction with their husband. And number three, they're going to talk about spiritual things. That was a huge upgrade for them. It was a massive upswing that Christianity brought into their pagan world. Now, it's greater than that because God talks about their, their, their oneness in Christ. He talks about their shared physical uh, benefits that the husband's wife, body doesn't belong to himself and his wife. The wife's body doesn't belong to her but her husband. That was an upgrade because it says she has equal rights with her husband when it comes to sexual things. And that means both of them should practice fidelity to one another. That was not common in their world at all. As a matter of fact, when we talk about marriage, marriage was viewed so lowly in their world. You've already heard part of this, but here's the rest of it. They could divorce without even telling the other person they were divorcing them. The person who owned the home could just tell the other person, you need to move out. Now, the women sometimes owned the home. The men owned the home sometimes. Whoever owned the home controlled the home base. So they could say, you just need to move. Or the one who didn't live there could just move out and never tell the other person. There is a historical document that shows that a woman, as she was going to marry the next man, sent a messenger to her husband to tell him that he, she had divorced him and she was getting remarried. Say, so that is awful. Yes, it is. They had such a low view of marriage, they didn't even care about those things. But that is a society in which they live. So now when we think about 1 Corinthians 7, it says that the man, or that, that the woman, should not leave her husband, right? And the man should not divorce his wife. Oh, that makes a lot more sense now that I understand the history. That's why we study the history, and it opens our eyes up to the meaning of the text. When we talk about all the issues of of homosexuality, when we talk about marriage and divorce, it's all a part of the package. The, the goddesses and the gods encourage people in their homosexuality, in their, in their sexual prom promiscuity, in the orgies. It was all a part of their thinking. That is where the gospel went. Now, when we talk about religion, the common practice with some of these religions, both with Aphrodite and with Bacchus or with Dionysius, is that they encourage women to, to take on masculine characteristics. As time went on, the goddess Venus or Aphrodite and the god Bacchus or Dionysius became blurred in, in how they actually appeared. The statues of them and the paintings of them start showing the feminine Venus with a beard and wearing men's armor. And Bacchus started becoming softer. He started having longer hair and wearing women's clothes. And what was happening was there was a gender blurring where they were losing track of male and female. Now think with me, 1 Corinthians says, what about how men and women should dress? Men should have short hair, women should have long hair, men should not wear women's clothes, women should not wear men's clothes. What are we talking about? It's the religious cult of their, of their world they're talking about. The women were, were breaking free of the restraints that they felt being locked in at home. And they had this cult that told them, you just need to put all that aside. You need to break free. You need to practice what you want in your own enjoyment of sexuality. You need to get away from all that masculine domination. And you need to get out and you need to rule. And my friends, guess what? Equality was not the goal. Just like it's not the goal of feminism today. Now I'm sorry if, if, if you think that women's empowerment is about equality. My dear friends, history says women's empowerment is about domination. And that's exactly what they wanted to do. And so they, they're, they're heroes. There was a king, as, as reported, that wanted to find out what the, the women were doing when they were worshiping Bacchus because it was this closed off thing. Men could not get in. So he dressed like a woman and climbed up in a tree so he could check it out. And they caught him. And the story goes, this is supposedly myth, but the story goes that when they caught him, they pulled him out of the tree and they tore him apart limb from limb. And that was a story that the women praised 
Their, their vengeance, their violence, their strength. As a matter of fact, some of these women were known as the Amazons. Have you heard of that before? Not the Amazon Prime. We're talking about the Amazons. These are women warriors. Some of them, it is reported that they went with Alexander the Great into battle as a whole group of women warriors. They were ferocious. It's all a part of the cult. In this, when we look specifically at, at Venus, she just encouraged outright orgies and just all kinds of gross sexual sin. But Bacchus was, was known in a different way. The worship of Bacchus had two primary concepts that they, they, they praised. The first one was ecstasy. And in this ecstasy, they, in their worship, they used alcohol, they used music, they used loud shouting, and the goal was to get whipped into a frenzy. Enthusiasm. And when they got to the height of this frenzy, they believed that they rose up and they made contact with their god, Bacchus. And when they did that, they achieved what they called enthusiasm. So ecstasy led to enthusiasm. Now guess what? How did they know that they actually made it? And the answer is, when they hit enthusiasm, they believed that Bacchus took over their mind, and when he took over their mind, he took over their mouth, and they began to talk in words nobody could understand. Do you understand that? My friends. That's tongues in the world's perspective. Not a biblical perspective on tongues, but a secular-minded perspective on what was called today tongues. And so think about this. In their world, that was the ultimate. That was what you wanted. Now think about the church in Corinth. We have three chapters, chapter 12, 13, and 14, devoted to spiritual gifts. And the primary reason that that passage is devoted there is because they were believing and they were practicing old thinking about spiritual gifts and their relationship to the gods. And they had taken that pagan concept and they saw biblical tongues, which is speaking in a language you've never understood before about the truths of God. But they were understandable as long as there was a translator, an interpreter, right? And, and they took that and they corrupted it. And they brought that into the church. And guess who the primary people were who were using it? It was women. Because they had come out of the old stuff. They brought it with them. It was still there. That's history, my friends. That is actual historical reality. And so now we begin to understand why 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 says what it does about the superiority over preaching rather than tongues. It's called prophecy. But it's not prophecy in the way we think. It's, it's, a, it's a declaration of the word of God to people. And 1 Corinthians 14 shows us that. Think with me. Remember what it says? <coughs> when you gather together, and, and someone who it comes into your midst from the outside, who is, is untaught or untrained, unlearned, and they hear you all speaking in tongues, what are they going to say about you? You are out of your minds. Right? My dear friends, one of the words that is used in the pagan religion of Bacchus is that when they attain to that time where he unites with them, they literally, the word is, they are out of their minds. They've lost control and he takes control. And they believe that you enter a state that is somewhat like a drug-induced state or drunkenness. You understand the current climate we live in? I'm sitting in a hotel in Uganda listening to a young couple talking. They are from a group of people here in the U.S. That, that believes that all the gifts are still functioning. And they're talking about the fact that they were with this group of people and they were so excited. Why? Because they were <coughs> drunk in the spirit. They were drunk in the spirit. They were out of control. And they said, this is it. This is the pinnacle. This is the top. They've reached it. So our dear friends, both here and there, are taught that you know that you're truly saved if you do what? You speak in tongues. But here's the problem with that. That's not biblical. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us this. And so turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Let me show you this. This is just super important. This is free, no charge. In this 
of this argument that the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, using him to speak, so the Holy Spirit gives us this, this concept. He's talking about this problem of how people think about the body. And we don't understand the unity of the body. We are one body with one head, and every part matters. We can't cut ourselves off from each other and be the body of Christ like God intends. And we can't say, I don't need you. I'm more important than you. And we can't say, oh, I want to be like that person because they've got a really important gift. I don't want to be this. I want to be the eyes. I don't want to be a little toe. Your body needs little toes, I promise. Just like it needs your thumb, right? Try working without an opposing thumb. It doesn't work very well. You need thumbs in the body. You don't need all eyes and ears and noses. But if you don't have the whole thing, it doesn't work right. That's what he's saying. And so when we think about the body, we know that the entire body is different and we all have our own part, right? So listen to this. He now comes to the whole concept of spiritual gifts. And so he says in verse 27, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? Stop. Verse 29. In the Greek language, this is fun with language, this is grammar, all right? When God gave the Greek language and he worked in them so they put it all together, there are certain ways that you say things in the Greek language that tell you what kind of an answer is expected. So there's a certain way you say something, ask a question, and by grammar it shows the expected answer is yes. There are other ways that when you use the form, the expected answer is no. My dear friends, every one of these questions is written grammatically with the expected answer of no. Now, this should make sense, right? Because look at this. Are, is every person an apostle? No. No, we know that. How many apostles are there? Well, 12 or 13, depending on what you do with Judas and, and Matthias and, and Paul, right? But not every person is an apostle. Are all prophets? Does everybody speak the word of God? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles even in that day when they were happening? No. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? What's the expected answer? No. So if we say, you have to speak in tongues to prove that you're saved, does the Bible agree with that? No. No! We would say that is false. That is a false teaching if you say that. Our dear friends in Uganda have been told this is fact. You have to speak in tongues, and if you don't speak in tongues, you're not a true believer. You don't have a true church. My friends, that same thing is being taught here, isn't it? Some of you have heard that before. Maybe even from the Pope. But the Bible says differently, doesn't it? This is the Word of God. The Word of God says, no, not all speak in tongues, and not all interpret. That's important. Now, it's also important with this. So let me take one more step, because in, in 1 Corinthians 14, I want you to see something. When we come to uh, the, the issue of prophecy in tongues, you just need to read through this whole thing in one sitting, 12, 13, and 14. But, but listen to what this says. Um, okay, verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two, or at the most three, and each in turn, but one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and God. Now, let me ask you a question. When we talk about apostles, how do you know who's qualified to be an apostle? Do you know what the qualifications are? We find them in Acts chapter 1. They have to be someone who is with the Lord from the beginning of his ministry. They had to be there through his crucifixion and resurrection because what? They were going to be a witness of his resurrection. So the only way you can be qualified to be one of those apostles is you have to meet the qualifications of Acts chapter 1. How do we know who's qualified to be a prophet? Well, that would be Deuteronomy chapter 13 and Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 13 tells us that if a person does something that even looks miraculous, but his message leads you away from God, you know he's false and he should be killed and you shouldn't listen to him at all. 
So we know, first of all, the first test of a prophet is that they only always teach according to the truth of God's word. And secondly, their prophecies always have to come true. 100% true. So if a person claims to be a prophet, but their prophecies aren't 100% true, they're clearly not a prophet from God. And so those, we know the qualifications for prophet. My brothers and sisters, there are no apostles today, and there are no prophets today. Not like that. And so if, you, if you've been influenced by the Kansas City prophets, some of you know who they are, they themselves acknowledge that all their prophecies don't come true, but, but they're trying to tell you that that's different now than it was then. God has only given us one standard. 100% truth, and they only lead you to God. The Kansas City prophets teach people that are things that are false. By, by the Old Testament, they're thankful. They should be thankful they don't live there. They should be dead. I'm not advocating harm. I'm not advocating murder. I'm just saying by the law, they would have been put to death. Because they're preaching what's false. And they don't always teach the truth. That's apostles and prophets. Number three, how about evangelists? We know who's qualified to be an evangelist. How do we know that? Because we have the gospel. The gospel is very clear. Paul says, I gave you the gospel, and if anybody, even myself, teaches it different, they deserve to go to hell. So we know the gospel is the clear teaching that evangelists have. We know who's qualified to be a teacher. They have to take the faithful word that's been given, they have to learn it, and they have to pass it on, right? We know who's qualified to be a pastor. We have Titus 1 and, and 1 Timothy 3. We have specific qualifications. Every office in the church has qualifications. Let me ask you this. Where do you find a qualification for an interpreter of tongues in Scripture? It's not there. It's not there. There isn't one. So how do they know? That's a really important question, isn't it? Because it says, if you don't have a known, qualified interpreter, tongues should never be heard in a church. Oh, that's really important, isn't it? And the question is, how did they know? I think I know. There was a person that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 called the discerner of spirits. It's not talking about somebody who can tell the difference between this demon and that demon. 1 John chapter 4, John says, many spirits have gone out from us. What is he talking about? He's talking about teachers. He's talking about people that have gone out, and he talks about the spirit of the Antichrist. I believe the discerner of spirits is a person that God gave in the early church who, who knew who was truly from God and who was not. And they were able to say, this is a true interpreter, this one is not. Now, that's, that's what I believe. You're going to have to study that. Your pastor may have a different idea than that. You can talk to him about that, and he can correct me. All right? But, but that's the only thing I can see. But I live in a world where people say, no, we speak in tongues all the time. And my question is, what does it say in Scripture? My constant question for my students is, what does it say? Not what I think, not what I believe. I want to know what the Scripture says because that's God's Word, and that's what you need, and that's what I need, right? And so we want to say, what does Scripture say? Okay, all that to say, why in the world are we talking about all these things? Because, my friends, we live in a world that is so much like Corinth, and it's crazy. Now, again, I'm not saying that the women are all locked in and all those sort of things. Some women may feel that way. But I'm talking about the, the reality of the sexual sin and the debauchery and the filth and the horrors of living in this current generation, right? And, and we can say, how can there be any hope in this world? And the answer is the gospel. Listen to what we're talking about. The Apostle Paul went to Corinth and he planted a church in Corinth in the midst of all that. And God said to him, Paul, don't be afraid. You got persecution, I got that, but I have many people here. Oh, that's exciting. God has a plan to save people. Corinth was a messed up place. And it was a messed up church when they started. You know what? That's good news for me, because I was a messed up guy. How about you? Were you messed up? Are there people around you that were messed up? Check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Are you ready? Starting in verse 9. In the context of people taking each other to court. Believers suing each other. He says in verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's people who commit all kinds of sexual sin, nor 
idolaters, nor adulterers. By the way, idolaters, people who worship anything other than God, that could be ourselves. We're all idolaters, my friends. Don't, don't pass it off as saying, I don't worship a thing of stone or metal or whatever. No, no, no. We idolize ourselves more than anything else. In our flesh, we're all idolaters, right? Nor idolaters, nor uh, the adulterers. What's that? People who commit sin, uh, commit sexual sin while they're married, right? Uh, or nor effeminate, nor homosexual. Say, what is that? Well, the word is very specific. The word for effeminate is the word malkos, means soft. It is the person in a homosexual relationship that carries out the female role. And typically, it's the person who allows themselves to be used by another person of the same sex. The second word is the arsenicoites. That's the person who is the aggressive male figure who abuses and uses the other person. God says both of them are part of this group that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, nor thieves, people who take what's not theirs, nor the covetous, uh, people who have a desire for more things, more and more and more, and they pursue getting that. Uh, drunkards, yes, it's not a disease, my friends. It's a command God gives us. It means it's a choice of the will to get drunk. You may get hooked, but you made choices to get there. It's called sin, and it has to be overcome by the grace of God, right? Nor swindlers, people who cheat others out of, out of money and things, will inherit the kingdom of God. You say, what? There's no hope for any of us. Who's not guilty of some of that? Oh, but wait, there is hope. Listen, next verse, verse 11. Such were, grammar, is were, present tense, future tense, or past tense? Past tense, praise God. Did you hear that? You were that. That's who you used to be. That's what you used to do that revealed who you were. But you're not that anymore. Every one of those things God has provided forgiveness for by taking the place to pay for that on the cross. Wow! Isn't that good news? Does America need that? Does Hammond need that? Do you need that? Do I need that? Yes, we do. We need that desperately. Such were some of you. But what? But you were washed. Your Filth, your spiritual filth was cleansed, made clean. You were sanctified. What is that? Made holy, set apart from sin to God, from the family of Satan to God's family, from the dominion and power of Satan to the dominion and power of God. You were sanctified. You were transformed by the grace of God. And the last thing is you were justified. God himself looked at you and said, because you have received the gospel and believe me, I declare to you that I see you as righteous in my sight. Wow. Praise the Lord. Do you say amen in this church? Amen. amen. Thank you. Wow. That is good news, right? Does our world need good news? Yeah. And we can say, and our world is horrible. Our world is shot. How would anybody ever believe that? Look at Corinth. Look at Corinth. That's why they're there. God saved the people of Corinth. Let me back up. God let the people of Corinth live in their filth so that he could save them out of their filth and show them to be transformed people who now bear the image of Christ. That is power, isn't it? It doesn't matter what the religion has been. It doesn't matter what the life has been, the lifestyle has been, the beliefs have been. God can deal with it all. And he has through the gospel. The gospel is life-transforming, supra-cultural truth. It is above your culture and my culture, your family, my family, my thinking, my feelings, your thinking, your feelings, whatever beliefs we may have. The gospel brings all those things into proper perspective as we submit ourselves to the word of God. That is amazing stuff. My friends, that's why missions matters. Because missions is just not out there. Missions is in your home. Missions is in your neighborhood. Missions is at your work. Missions is at the grocery store. My friends, I'll talk about this later. Missions is how you drive and how you conduct your business with your friends and the people you work with. Because if they see you drive like trash and you try to talk to them about Jesus, they're not going to believe that, right? They're going to say, no, no, I see how you drive. <laughs> the Spirit of God does not control your drive, but I promise you. Right? Oh, this is life-changing, life-transforming truth for the whole world, no matter how bad, how
how wicked, what their past is, what their religions are, what their beliefs are, all of it changes when they come to understand the gospel. So can I just say to you real quickly, there's something you need to know. Number one, God is perfect in his righteousness. The only way he can accept you and me is that we have a perfect righteousness. Oh, we have a problem. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? God is perfect in his justice. As a perfect judge, he must judge all sin. How many of you sin? Be honest, all of us. God already said it. You don't have to raise your hand. I already know if you don't or not. You sin. God is just. He has to judge you. You don't share his perfect righteousness. The only way for you to be saved is that somebody has to die for you. God himself came to earth in the man we know of as Jesus. Fully God, fully man, joined himself to humanity, lived a perfectly righteous life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice to die for our sin. And he took our place, took our punishment, and now he says, i got a gift for you. If you'll believe me. If you'll believe me about who I am, who you are, what your problem is, and say, wow, God, I am hopeless in myself. But I hope in you. You took my place. You paid my penalty. You gave yourself for me. I believe you. Thank you. I receive that gift. And he says, at the moment you do that, you have eternal life. You are justified. The judge declares you righteous. As though you have never sinned. And you are his ever. Because what? He washes you and he sanctifies you when he justifies you. That's who you used to be. You're not defined by that any longer. Isn't that good news? Don't let anybody tell you. I know who you are. You say, no, you know who I used to be. You don't know who I am. God is transforming me so that I can be who he made me to be in Christ. That's who I am. I am in Christ. I'm a new creation, right? If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. You are a new creation. Don't ever let go of that. And your past will never define you again. Because you are no longer living in the past. You are living in Christ. And you have a new hope in Him. Because you are seated at the right hand of the Father. In Christ. In the heavenly places. And you will forever be that. That's good news. Changes life. That's what we're about. That's what I do. I teach my students those things. I seek to pass that on to them. So they can pass it on to their people. So they can be transformed. God is transforming our students. He's transforming the community. In the Toro district where we work in the east of Uganda, there used to be, when I started, about 500,000 people. The main pastor I worked with told me, he said, Pastor, after about six or seven years, fully a quarter of the people of our, of our, our district have been affected by your teaching poverty. That's not me. That's God. God's taking his word, using it through the pastors I'm teaching. They're taking the message. God is changing things. We talked about the gospel one day, and a man said, I have not heard that message for 30 years, my friends. He was a leader of a church group. 30 years since he heard the gospel clearly. We have to change that. Right? So I'd encourage you to be people who have the gospel clear and who have the hope of the gospel that no one is outside of the reach of God's power and his truth to what Jesus has done. That is mission, right? No matter where we go. Brother?